exactly what he had in his books that he had published. Um, and there was a loose connection to uh, earlier on in the project before it changed hands. So we went to the National Register and we're like, we're not even really sure he's the architect, but we're pretty sure. And by the way, the integrity of almost all of the homes has been compromised. Uh, but um, because we had um, such similar architecture and because he had been mentioned in the earliest plans before the subdivision changed hands, the National Register agreed that he, um, they made the leap that he is the architect of these homes. And because of its association with civil rights in Las Vegas, they listed it on the National Register. So this is a really good example of, again, um, a neighborhood that has maybe not uh, stellar architectural integrity, but has a really strong association to something very important that happened in our history. Um, again, with, uh, with um, Paul Williams, he designed the La Concha, which used to be on the strip. You can see it in its original location in the postcard on the left. It's now the lobby for the Neon Museum. It was moved in 2005. Um, and it's a moved building, so now it's been taken out of its location, its uh, setting, its, you know, all these things have changed. The workmanship has possibly changed because we had to cut it into 11 pieces uh, to move it, but the, um, it, this National Register nomination is pending, so um, we're hoping that that uh, goes through. So um, do we have time? I can talk about Section 106 or, okay. So Section 106 is, is one of the more interesting um, aspects of my job because uh, the Federal re Review stuff is always fun to kind of pick through. Um, Section 106 is, it requires the federal government basically to take into account their impacts um, that they might have on historic buildings for any project that they're doing. So if they want to build a highway through an historic neighborhood, they have to take into account that that neighborhood might be impacted um, and how can they mitigate those impacts. I work less with those larger projects and more with these individual projects where we might get federal funding to rehabilitate a building. And one of these examples is the um, Mob Museum in Las Vegas, which is the official name is the National Museum of Organized Crime and Law Enforcement. It was built in 1933, and we kind of had the triple whammy because the, the General Services Administration sold us, sold us the building for a dollar, so we had that federal nexus. We had federal tax credits, um, and it was a, um, and some other federal funding. So we, and it's listed on the National Register, so we had the triple whammy where they were, um, very specific about the things that we could and could not do in the building. And of course, you're turning a post office into a major tourist attraction. So all of the exhibits had to be floating. Every single thing that was done had to be reversible. So one example is we had to restore all of the finishes that had been removed at some point. Like the plaster ceilings, we had to have a master plasterer come in and restore all the ceilings that we then covered up with a fake ceiling for the museum. Another job, um, I, I have a side gig. I work for the Bureau of Reclamation in Boulder City and I, I help them manage their historic properties and they're a federal uh, agency, so of course they've got to comply with this Section 106. And they, um, this is an historic district, the little green area, those two buildings are in the historic district. Uh, and this is an original picture of their campus that started construction in the 30s when they were building Hoover Dam. Um, they went through a programmatic agreement with uh, the feds, the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation, and then local uh, preservation advocates. And what came out of that was that any new construction had to be compatible with the historic architecture of the industrial campus, this stuff, which is corrugated metal, and the historic architecture of the district. So um, essentially any new buildings, like if you can see here, you know, this was, we would want any new buildings to, you know, be aligned this way, be, be, uh, have a massing of an industrial building. We had to pull out the specific qualities that we thought were key elements of, of the historic buildings. So what we came up with um, is the green building. So this is where all of their offices are now combined on, in a new campus. The green building on, um, that's the new building on the right. Uh, the front of it is all concrete and it has um, the lines of windows that mimic 
the admin building, which is their admin building in Boulder City that was built in the 30s. So that part is the part that faces the historic district and is compatible with the historic architecture of the district. This half, which is corrugated metal, is the part that faces the campus. And it actually turned out really well. When the, guy, when the contractors came in and they're like, this is what we're going to do, we laughed. And we thought, this is going to look terrible. But it, it turned out really nice. You have this kind of way, if this feeling of a purpose-built industrial architecture on the one side that's kind of rambling. And then you have you know, you know, the big windows. And then on the other side, you have this more traditional, formal architecture. And how they joined them so that it was clear, you know, if you're, that this, w this was on purpose, is they kind of made this big reveal here where the concrete um, extends past the corrugated metal. So another, you know, just small detail, but it shows um, that the building is not historic. So that's the historic preservation in a nutshell. <laughs> the nuts and bolts. D uh, do you have any questions? Do you find it more difficult to deal with neighborhoods and districts or with individual projects, would you say? Because with a neighborhood, you have a whole bunch of people who yeah. get involved. But with individual projects, you also have a lot of other people who might be getting involved. So I was just wondering. Um, individual, uh, right. There's always the benefit of having the, 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 prop, the one property owner that's going to be impacted coming to you and saying they want their building um, designated. The only tough situation there is if you really feel that it doesn't qualify and then you kind of have to break the news to them gently. Um, and sometimes with, with the notification process, because we have a, a radius, you have people that are opposed because they think it's like a cancer and they don't want it to spread to their house. Um, but that's very rare. The districts, of course, um, it, it's a long process. I mean, we've been working with Beverly Green now for probably four mm -hmm. years. And they're still collecting signatures. And of course, as people move, then you have to go to the new property owners and see if they're in support. And we may look at changing some of the uh, process based on just this recent um, experience with Beverly Green. But Beverly Green um, is an interesting example because half of that neighborhood is in a gaming overlay, <laughs> which was not supposed to extend into a residential area. So we're not really sure how that happened. Um, we're looking at that now. But at one time, you know, I don't know, back in the 90s or something, these big casinos came to the property owners and they said, we'll give you $6 million for your home. Well, we haven't had one single application from a casino developer to develop any of that. But yet, there's still, this is 20 years later, these people are still hanging on to this, that somebody's going to come and give them 2 to $6 million for their properties. And it's just not going to happen. So... Um, we're looking at now how we can uh, move back the gaming overlay to be, a, you know, to more of commercial area um, to give the property owners, you know, they'll have kind of realistic expectations of the value of their property. So that's the main sticking point with that particular neighborhood. But yes, oh, and with Vegas, with everything being new, you have the, how can this be old? I built this home, uh, you know, in the 40s. So. Well, you also have, Courtney may not one of the horror story of the one designated district that we do have, the people had come to uh, Johnna's Park. They had come to us. They wanted it. The city said, okay, we'll look into it. You do all the studies. You do all the hearings. You have all the meetings. And then you have, do you, were you there for the first meeting? The one for, I don't think so. Um, Brian Scott lost his mind? No. Okay, so we had the, uh, <laughs> That's funny. We had the, <laughs> the last meeting before we went to planning commission for adoption. So we're almost all done. And it had been a big love fest up until then. So the last meeting, that guy that wanted to turn his property into commercial. Right. Next to the banquet hall. <clears throat> so this one guy comes, and he, again, had visions of all this money that was going to come to him because he was going to have his property rezoned to commercial. And he had found a couple of other people that just hadn't been involved during the first two years that this was going on. And he came and the whole meeting blew up. Absolutely blew up. People are screaming, you're, you know, this is America, you're taking away our property rights. <laughs> well, the, the deputy city attorney who was assigned to land use issues really didn't know anything, well, 
didn't know anything about land use issues, but he also didn't know anything about historic <laughs> preservation. And so he's standing there, and these people are getting all pissed off. And all of a sudden, so we're planning, well, the planners are trying to think of, well, what are we going to do to calm this situation down? And the city attorney goes off and starts telling him he doesn't want to hear it and you can't talk this way. And we're trying to get him out of the room because, like Courtney says, you, you go along on these processes and you think that everything's fine and then it blows up at the last minute. And it really only takes one yeah. that can then spark the entire neighborhood into, well, gee, nobody told us we could rezone and turn into commercial and la di da -dee, which of course wasn't true. <laughs> but it, it only takes one to, to take a calm and peaceful and kumbaya process and turn it into a war zone. And you never know who's going to spark even the city attorney. Well, and they said, some people said that they had not been to any of the meetings, but we had photographs right. of them. They were, they were photocopying signature yeah, pages. Signatures, well, well, I, would that be you? That, let's see, there's that meeting, oh, and then that one, and then, oh my gosh, look, here you are again. Well, they were, they were photo, remember they were photocopying yeah, the yeah. petition in, of opposition handed all these crumpled papers to Margo, and it was like this. <laughs> she said, I know there's not that many property owners, and they're photocopies. So, you know, and it's misinformation, like you can't paint your house. Well, you can paint your house whatever you want. It's uh, a, a historic press on both sides of the issue. You have the advocates that are, as we always say, uh, report to a higher authority because historic preservation is the, the realm of godliness. So to those who are advocates, they report to a higher authority. And then you have those that this is America, I can do with my house whatever you want to, to which you, we say, yes, you still can, but they don't want to hear it. Because somebody has put the bug in the ear that Steve Wynn is going to come to them and build the brand new Bellagio on their 50 by 100 lot. <laughs> Somehow or the other. Somehow or the other. Any other questions for Courtney? I have one more war story for you to tell. I mean, she doesn't know how I'm going to do this. <laughs> tell about your current situation. Oh, uh, which one? The street, the street going through. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> uh, oh, well, you know, I have that a picture of the building in the other PowerPoint. Yeah, you should do. I, so what we have should I build here, it up? Or? So what we have is the, the city's... Um, cultural corridor area, which is where we have our museums and uh, the city's library, the Natural History Museum, and a city building that's been there since uh, 1963. 1963. You, it was the former city hall, yeah. it built as an LDS church, former city hall. And now it's it's across from our minor league baseball stadium in this area of all these activities, and it is a playhouse. They have plays there. Kids go there to learn how to play musical instruments. They learn drama. They put on plays. And it's owned by the city. But the city, it's this building right here. But the city, like everybody else, has visions of what they're going to do. And Ms. Mooney will tell you about where we are now. So um, actually, I can kind of, if I go back to this map here, it's not the best map. but. The vision is to put light rail up this street here, which is Maryland Parkway, have it go up and up and up and up, and then it's going to cut, I guess it does keep, have it in here, kind of where it says cultural corridor trail, it's going to cut across, and they're at, calling at this. At Cashman? Yes, at Cashman. At the, at the baseball field. Right, and it's going to be called the Cultural Vista Boulevard or whatever. And then it's going to come back down into downtown, and this is the link, the, the light rail connection into downtown. To the BRT. Yes, pretty sure. Um, so they've decided that it would be a really good idea for the road to go right here and lop off this whole wing of this building. Now, this 1963 building is virtually architecturally intact. It's, it's had these wood panels here that were put over the, the original tile. It's, um, it's in really beautiful shape. And part of the whole um, charm of it is its symmetricality. So um, it's one of those things where, you know, a few years from now, people are going to look at that and say, what were they thinking? You know, why was it so important to put that road there? 
Uh, so our uh, ordinance allows the Historic Preservation Commission to comment on um, uh, projects that might impact historic buildings in Las Vegas and it's like I said they are just a recommending board they have no teeth whatsoever they can only say they can even pass a resolution that says I oppose we as a commission oppose the lopping off of the southern wing of the Reed Whipple building um, and that doesn't really do anything other than put them formally on the record as opposing this action um, so I recommended to my um, manager and I said you know we we really need to bring this to the commission because if we don't and they lop that southern half off and we never get a road there and then years later the commission finds out or you know two weeks after it's lopped off they find out about it it's going to be crazy and our um, our uh, chairman of the historic preservation commission was for many years uh, the news manager of one of the channels and then he was like VP news manager or VP of news for Sunbelt Communications which is huge uh, all over California, Arizona, um, Utah and so he's very well connected to the media and anytime anything happens he shows up with a news crew so I thought let's save ourselves the embarrassment let's go to the commission let's get it over with let's take our beating Let's take their resolution, which means nothing, and get on with our lives. <laughs> and um, all chaos is occurring right now over this decision because now the commission wants to see alternatives and they want, um, uh, they basically want us to come to them and say why it can't go someplace else, which I think is reasonable. Um, and um, so we, we're kind of in the middle of this right now. We don't, we don't know where it's going to happen, but if I get fired, you'll see me guest lecturing a lot more. <laughs> <laughs> the, the interesting story here to me is the, the staff members that in this instance are saying, well, let's just hurry up and do it. Let's lop that puppy off. Courtney, quit being a naysayer. Quit, quit being the historic preservation officer. Quit doing your job. Those same people were the people that fought so hard and spent so much money on the Mob Museum to bring that building back to what it is today. So people aren't always one way or the other. The same folks that might be a historic preservation advocate on one project can turn around a few minutes later and say, well, why are they commenting on this? What's it to them? We don't want them to get in the way of progress. So it isn't as though, people, this might become a shock to you younger persons, but Courtney and I have learned that people are not always consistent. <laughs> people are not always consistent. Those same people who can argue one way, one day, on one issue, can the next argue just as fervently the opposite perspective. And that's exactly where, when Courtney was telling me this story last night, all I kept thinking in the back of my head was, because of course we know the people, golly, isn't that the same person that was willing to die <laughs> to get the post office building refurbished back to the gnat's eyelash of going to the original designer of the chandelier features to have them reconstructed yeah. <laughs> so that they were the exact replicas of the chandeliers that were in the original building. Well, there's no money in this building. <laughs> and that's the key thing, right? The Mob Museum had a plan, and it was going to generate revenue. This building, we cannot get at least to save our lives. The Shakespeare Theater folks moved out. It's been empty for a couple of years. It's in a location that's been difficult. Yeah. It's in a location that, prior to the crash, there were a lot of residential and mixed-use buildings that were actually approved right in that area. That mm -hmm. one site I love that's above the library right. that has like the views, All the views to yeah. So this was an area that prior to the crash it had a lot of hope, but now post-crash it's not first on the list, right? It's not first on the list. And so they now have a different idea and so all those same principles of truth, justice, and historical preservation now are just naysayers in the way of progress from the same persons, just a few years difference. So historic prez, I always told Courtney she had the best job in the world. Twelve years later she says she's not so sure, but 
It's still the best job. It's still the best job. But, you know, sometimes you have the best job and you're happy to give it to somebody else. <laughs> um, it has tremendous wins and then it has great potential for losses. Soul-crushing losses. And we used, to, we used to joke, did you, we, our pith helmets? Yeah. We had real pith helmets and we would say that we needed to put on our pith helmets when we went to the HPC meeting because you never knew whatever we did wasn't right, it wasn't enough, we were inaccurate, there was more research to be done. And so even doing your very best, you were never sure if the people that you were working for and with might not feel that it was never enough. And of course those that disagreed, it was way too much. And that's part of what his dark friends is. I've replaced my pith helmet with something uh, you're offers fascinated much by more that as I protection. Am. Yeah. It's just a fascinating <laughs> thing. It's like having a, an odd critter in the classroom. <laughs> so any more questions for Courtney? Okay, thank you very much. And we're gonna do a little bit of housework here before uh, before I let the uh, young people go. Uh, please remember those of you going on the Palm Springs trip.